your agency could expire. You must have a definite agency time frame. So you list it January the 1st, it expires July the 1st. Now, people ask all the time, what's the common listing length? I don't know. There is no such thing. This is something your managing broker will tell you. He would have the right to go, hey, we only take three month listings or hey, we only take 12 month listings. So there's no standard and there's no de definition. It's up to the managing broker that will tell you what he wants. There are some other ways. You could mutually agree. What does the word mutual mean? Mutual means both parties agree. You could both agree that you're done listing the property. The seller could go, hey man, dude, I don't like your hairstyle. And the listing agent go, well, I don't like the color of your shirt. Let's uh, both agree to go our separate ways. You can do that. That is called a mutual release of a listing. One party could breach the listing agreement. I've had this happen. I had a good friend of mine was an investor. I listed one of his rental properties. And every time I called the tenant to show the property, there was always some reason why they couldn't get in. Oh, my grandmother's visiting. Oh, we didn't put the dogs away. Oh, the house is a mess. So virtually, I never got a chance to show the property. And that violates the seller's obligation to me was to give me access so we could sell the property. So I called the seller who was a friend of mine. I'm like, hey, Lee, we got a problem. I can never get in. I've tried four times. You need to go explain to your tenant that you're selling the property to another investor and that they're still going to maintain their lease. But we need to get in to see the property. And until you do that, I am terminating our listing and taking it off the market because I'm not wasting any more of my time trying to sell a property I can't even get in to show. The seventh way <clears throat> would be an operation of law, like a bankruptcy. If your client calls you and says, hey, my wife and I are going to file bankruptcy, that could potentially terminate uh, a listing agreement. Uh, divorce proceedings could terminate a listing. So there are other ways called the uh, operation of law. So those are the seven ways to terminate a listing agent. Now, I want to go over and look at, show you one thing. When that termination, remember, we had those six obligations. We got care, obedience, loyalty, disclosure, accounting, and confidentiality. And we told you to remember uh, cold AC. <clears throat> now, during that agency time frame, from the time frame that you start the agency to the time frame it terminates in one of those seven ways or one of those six ways, if it's the buyer, you owe these six fiduciary obligations. Now, what I want you to see is during agency, you owe those six fiduciary responsibilities. Now, agency terminates for any of those reasons. You still owe these two. And you owe them in perpetuity. All right? Let me explain. After agency terminates for any of those reasons, the accounting and the fact that you were given confidential information is always an obligation that you will hold forever. So let's say a client calls you and says, hey, Raymond, I'm getting ready to do my taxes. You sold my house last year and you were the best agent in the world. And I say, of course I was. <laughs> but I noticed when doing my taxes that the $500 of earnest money was not accounted for on the closing statement. Can you find out what happened to that? I cannot say, well, sorry, 
my agency is terminated, I no longer owe you obligations because that is an accounting issue. And I keep those forever. Even though agency is done, I still have to account for the money. I would say, oh, geez, I guess we didn't catch that. Let me call the title company and I'll get back with you. The same thing is true if your client told you, I am selling my house because my wife and I are getting divorced and I'm very motivated, and then agency terminates, you cannot use that information against him. You cannot go find a buyer and go, hey, come on, dude, let's go look at this house because the guy's motivated because they're getting divorced. No, confidentiality information maintains in perpetuity unless it becomes public knowledge, all right? <clears throat> So these two obligations you maintain beyond the life of the agency. You maintain all six of them during agency and then agency ends. You no longer care for that. You no longer are uh, obliged to obey them. You don't have the loyalty. You aren't disclosing any more stuff to them, but you still keep those last two forever. All right. So now we have talked about customer before. I have mentioned this, but let's go over it one more time in the structured outline so that you can see it. Remember, a customer is a person with whom you have no agency. Now, here is what I will say. I am going to attribute this to my mentor, the guy that started me teaching 20 some years ago. He had this saying, and here's the easy six words that you can remember. When it comes to a customer, do no harm, do no help. This is what Dan Miller, my mentor, used to say. I still use this as an homage to him. This is the easy way to remember how you treat a customer. Don't help them. That's not my job. Don't give them information. That's not common knowledge, I mean. But don't harm them either. You can't lie to them. You can't mislead them. You can't give them false information. Do no harm, do no help. You still have to give reasonable skill and care to them to make sure they don't get harmed. You still have to be honest and fair. And you still have to disclose all the known facts because that's required from the other side. That is how you give customer level service. And back to the example that I gave. If the client says, is the house for sale? Yes, it is for sale. That's customer level. Is it 400,000 and you say, no, it's listed at 425. That is customer level. Oh, 425 seems a bit high. Would they take less? And you say, yes, they're motivated. Ding, 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 ding. You now gave him something beyond customer level because you gave them help. That is the implied agency. So customer level, reasonable skill and care, be honest and fair, and disclose all of the things that you should. All right? That is the customer level service that you must give to a person with whom you have no agency. Now, when you create agency and create a client, then you now you're into those six that we just talked about. <clears throat> Some states disallow opinions. Most states do, still give that. I want to caution you as a practicing professional, be cognizant of the fact to not give your opinion because you do not want somebody at a later time coming back. Typically, I have learned that when people say, so what do you think? Well, you know, I'm, I really love the house I'm in. I'm not buying this house. I really have no opinion one way or the other. But you can give an opinion as long as it is not given with an intent to deceive. All right. Yes, this is 
a nice house, in my opinion. You can get in trouble if you intentionally misrepresent something. That is called fraud. That is lying. Don't do this. Don't commit fraud. Don't intentionally tell them that you know the roof's got a hole in it and you go, oh, the roof's perfect. That would be fraud because you are intentionally misleading them. All right. There is this thing called puffing. Now, puffing is also frowned upon in some states. Puffing is where you exaggerate the benefit as long as it's not fraudulent. So your client says, uh, Raymond, isn't that the toxic waste dump across the street? And you go, it most certainly is. But this house has the best view of that toxic waste dump there is. <laughs> that's puffing, okay? I wasn't fraudulent. I didn't lie to him. Yes, that's the waste dump. But I exaggerated the benefit. This is the best view of the toxic waste dump of any house. That would be considered puffing. The one that will get you in the trouble the easiest is what's called negligent misrepresentation. These are things that you should have known, but you failed to disclose because somebody's going to rely upon your statement. A good example, lead-based paint. We haven't got to it. However, we all know that it's a federal disclosure. You forget to tell the client that it's got lead-based paint. The judge in the court case that you will be involved in, trust me, is going to say, Mr. Modulin, are you not licensed? Yes, I am licensed. Did you not take a 90-hour class to teach you about this? Yes, I did. You should have known, and you still made a mistake. That is negligent on your part. That is negligent misrepresentation. You should have known better. Okay. Now, one of the requirements for disclosure is this disclosure of adverse conditions. All right. Now, there are some adverse conditions that are required to be disclosed federally, like lead-based paint, contaminated soil, things of that nature. The other things that need to be disclosed are what is called a material defect. Material, in this case, means a known defect. Hey, dude, come on in the open house, but I want to tell you there's a hole in the roof. And your buyer says, well, that's okay, I'm a roofer, I can fix it. Or that potential buyer goes, you know, I'm out. I don't even want to go see the house. Okay, we just saved both of us a bunch of time. Now, there are situations in which a latent defect could be present. A latent defect is a defect that is not known and cannot be found without a specialized in, uh, inspection. The best example in this are termites, all right? And just for future reference, you guys can't, you know, cannot use the word termite, right? They are now called termite Americans. <laughs> no. Termites are a word that only a person that is licensed, and I believe Purdue University is the only one in the state of Indiana that allows a home inspector to get licensed, they can use the word termites. We use the word WMDs, word, <laughs> wood destroying insects, WDIs, <laughs> WNDs, that's weapons of mass destruction, too much politics going on in my head. WDIs, wood destroying insects, because it could be a termite, could be a carpenter ant. I don't know. I'm not trained. But that's a good example. You look at a house and you look at a room and you go, oh, well, look at this room. It looks perfect. So you don't disclose anything because you don't know. Now the home inspector comes in and finds termites behind the wall. And now that is a latent defect. It is one that was found by a special inspection. Radon could be a latent defect. Hey, I didn't even know that. Once a latent defect becomes known, it will now become a material defect 